I'd like to introduce um, Kairani Baroka. Um, she is a um, writer, a poet, and an artist from Jakarta um, who has done a lot of work on, um, yeah, on looking at colonialism and on, um, on environmental justice. And today she's gonna be talking to us about language and languaging peatlands and also about peatland cosmology. And I think this will bring a new and interesting uh, lens into the whole discussion that we've been having on peatlands and rights of peatlands. And I'm really excited to hear this. So um, if you'd like to take over, that would be great. Thank you so much, Mila, and thank you so much to everyone on the repeat team. I'm a big fan of all of you and what you do, <laughs> so I'm very um, grateful to be invited back. Uh, I've, I've spoken for repeat before, and my presentation is a little bit different from what I've said before. If you've heard me on repeat in the past, please excuse me. I'm going to kind of zip through the things that I've said previously, but as mentioned, the focus of this session is on language and languaging peatlands. So I'm an Indonesian woman with short hair and round silver earrings and a patterned yellow dress and I'm sitting on a great couch. So I'm just going to share this presentation. Um, this session is entitled Rooted Survival in Indonesian. It is Keselamatan Yang Berakar. So Indonesian peatlands have a lot to do with all of us here today. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it for too long, but Indonesia is home to around 14 million hectares of peatlands, approximately 23% of the world's total tropical peatlands. So between a quarter and a fifth of the world's tropical peatlands are in Indonesia. And um, peatlands are also a site of violence. And it's, uh, I think it's interesting to destabilize what we think of as quote unquote nature as being very pristine and in Indonesia it is you know peatlands are a site of violence in 2015 peat fires and related toxic haze you know killed around 500,000 people in Indonesia alone so it is a, a site of environmental genocide right um, and Indonesia itself which is a lot of some people over my life have said oh Indonesia is a group of tiny islands um, <laughs> it's as wide as the United States it's the largest coastline in the world and it has the fourth most populous um, it is the fourth most populous nation in the world I think around 275 million of us and we have within Indonesia over 700 languages and cultures. So in the Indonesian language itself, uh, my first language, Bahasa Indonesia, which means Indonesian language, don't say Bahasa, <laughs> that just means language, and I get really annoyed when people say Bahasa. <laughs> um, it was created, it's a lingua franca, right? It is what people across the various, we have over 17,000 islands, I believe, used to communicate with each other, and was also a really important tool against colonialism, right, in order to create this sort of sense of national identity um, and identity formation. But within Indonesian, islands there are over 700 languages so indonesia is both colonized and colonizer right over 350 years we were colonized by the dutch at certain points we were a french colony which a lot of people don't know for about four years we were a british colony for about four years in what was called the british interregnum in the early 1800s and the portuguese were in there the spanish were in there. there's like so many words <laughs> in my language when you know when i was in brazil i was like same word and you know you go to another place it's like oh same word and you realize the effects of so many different European colonizations on Indonesia right but we are also a colonizer country and by that I mean that Indonesia colonizes Papua who is Papua right um, and Indonesia is itself a dominant language so we have to learn Indonesian in school but much like English is a colonial language, you know, it has a dominant effect over these 700 other languages. So as a writer and artist, what I try and do is I try and process the sense of environmental anxiety and grief I have <laughs> had throughout my life from relating to, you know, what's been going on with peatlands, etc. And I try and turn it into some kind of art. I'm a Libra moon. I don't know if that resonates with any. <laughs> <laughs> but so my first book was called Indigenous Species, um, and I, we see a blue and abstract neon colored glitch art inspired pattern. Um, and it was the story of an indigenous girl who gets kidnapped and is taken up river and she's really angry at what's happening around her and she's it's a monologue and she's saying, um, and I'm reading from the page. Uh, 
hear, I bet you from the rockish machinery I'm hearing and the smell of rashness, that this is where the grease deals are siphoned into miners' food and where they're packing down eons of intricacies and strength from the forest to molecular form on a woman's lipstick bottle in Iowa. And I knew when I made this book that I wanted to have this page on it, which is a lipstick made out of rainforest. Um, uh, Indonesia is the world's largest palm oil producer and palm oil has a lot to do with peatlands. So half of everything you have in your groceries from your soaps to your detergents to your shampoos, your moisturizers, your lipsticks, your ramen, <laughs> it, all your biscuits, it, it all contains palm oil, half of it. And Indonesia is the world's largest producer of it. And palm oil plantations, are a lot of them are created over peatlands, right? destruction of peatlands, creation of palm oil rainforest, uh, excuse me, palm oil plantations, right? And so when people say, oh, the answer to climate change is plant trees, I'm always like, which trees? Because some trees are very destructive and palm oil plantations are actually causing climate change, right? So be careful with quote unquote plant trees as a sort of catch all as we're talking about languaging here. Um, I know a lot of people, for instance, in, here in London where I am, where I work, um, uh, who are vegan and they're like, I don't get the palm oil bit, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, veganism is a good, uh, it's in the right direction, but palm oil is still part of veganism, right? And we have to contend with all these contradictions within how we relate to the environment. So my last book is called Ultimatum Orangutan, or Ultimatum Orangutan. And speaking of language, Orangutan or Orangutan is an Indonesian word. It's a compound word. Orang means person or people of the forest. Utan means forest. So every time you say Orangutan, you're speaking Indonesian. <laughs> and the and the title is in both languages. And I, I thought it was um it's 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 the title that I wanted for this book, which is very personal to me. The cover here is like my hand sort of doing a hadouken against a bulldozer, and the background is my mother's um, ancestral home in Tanahdatar, West Sumatra, which is which has all the um, rolling paddy fields there, because of how I feel about how peatlands and quote unquote nature are portrayed within Western environmentalism. Bahasa has mentioned is language, but also languages. So another cool thing about Indonesian is. A word can be plural and singular, right? Even the word one. The word one or satu can mean ones. It depends on context. It's all contextual. So that's why, so I'm editor of a journal called Modern Poetry in Translation, right? And every Indonesian translation into English, I think is science fiction, <laughs> it's sci-fi, right? Because it can be, it can, there's no like correct translation because every word that is singular could also be plural, right? Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way in which cosmology of language occurs in my brain, right? That everything that's singular is also plural. And that relates to how, in terms of cosmology and the environment, there's this Western individualism, right? That came with the enlightenment, the sense of I, the sense of self, that erodes our sense of community cosmologies in lots of indigenous cultures. So again, I'm gonna zip through things I've said previously at repeat, but the Anthropocene, <laughs> as I as I perceive it, and as lots of indigenous communities around the world perceive it, it's not a new event. Um, indigenous scholars Oyas Todd and Heather Davis said, it's not a new event, it's rather the continuation of practices of dispossession and genocide, coupled with the literal transformation of the environment that have been at work for the last 500 years. So it's not new. <laughs> this, you know, I think a lot of, especially white Westerners think, you know, the Anthropocene is something over the last 100 years, industrial revolution, and it's like, no, it's when European colonization hit and uprooted and destroyed so much of land and peoples. Um, and it continues the logic of this universal. I, I, I kind of chafe against this concept of the universal, right? It's which is structured to sever the relations between mind, body, and land. If you think of mind, body, and land as different things, you're actually going against a lot of indigenous cosmologies. And um, the Nigerian philosopher uh, Bayoko Malafe says, what we rudely call nature, quote unquote, today does not even have a name in Yoruba culture because there's no distinction between us and the goings on around us. Mountains, mountains could be consulted, trees could have privileges. In Western discourse, there's a clear distinction between man and nature, and that is not how the majority world, which is not the white Western minority, operate. And also, it results in a lot of people contributing to organizations, to funds, to schemes in which nature is separate from man. And this has really destructive policies, not only in terms of World Wildlife Fund, for instance, funding guards who have tortured and killed people, 
Um, but also in terms of carbon offsetting, which is, uh, as Greenpeace UK says, become the most popular and sophisticated form of greenwashing around. And London is, you know, Rishi Sunak, the UK Chancellor, is aiming to make London the global hub for the trade of voluntary carbon offsets. So I'm going to take you into the world of poetry for just one second, and I'm going to read you the titular poem from Ultimatum Rangutan or Ultimatum Orangutan, uh, the bilingual title. So, okay, um, and this this has to do with the terms that I'm going to ask you all to sort of mull around your mind. Ultimatum Orangutan. The original King Kong story was set on an island off Sumatra, perhaps Nias. So this is twisted phobia of what is now Indonesian man and fear of his usurping of his big hairy hands on a blonde ingenue on the needle of white capitalism, the empire state building. I understand visual chimp language. I know what KK was trying to say in every edition of that film. Naomi Watts may not have understood, but for years I was obsessed with the painting of a young brown child next to a monkey by abuser Gogan, and have stared many hours at that monkey as stand in for some kind of brown masculinity, cow domestic speaking across the years, transcending forms of visual media, asking King Kong softly, what is this world we were drawn into? And I think it's apt that <laughs> so Frankie is literally drawing as we speak. I'll tell you, small animal, a world where for decades, small children under a red and white sigil, the Indonesian flag is red and white, were lullabied. The women's rights and labor organizers were sadists, did unspeakable things, dancing sexily in their communist gear, killed the generals like animals. Instead of being told, Generals organized a genocide of people suspected of communism, likely millions of people ended, who were simply feared of usurping, remember the film, rounded up for no master other than bloodthirst, gentle artist among them, who drew their last in 1965-66. Rewind, perhaps not no master, ultimately nobody's real uncle by the name of Sam sanctioned slash planned all of this to open up lands with giant forklift hands, letting millions of bodies fall to the ground as it was all lifted into another country entirely. People's homes and cosmologies and rainforest lifted and dropped into the laps of people who cannot pronounce us and only the most powerful of those who can, who claim to be of us. And so many wrestled this machinery with lives paid for for so very long. Marcina at 24 are many of stealth, but the sigil fist, but the red and white, the red and white and blue, it caved us and caved us and caved us. Many forced to drink from it and many said, Tida, no. And every year, get the Apollo S, 30th September, they show the violent film recreating supposed mutiny, images of blood that snapped our childhoods in two. When I speak to people about palm oil plantations as devastation of Papuans, Dayak, Padang, et al., invariably the words palm oil make them think of orangutans. We need to save them. I found myself thinking orangutans and so many peoples as well, but this phrase does not fit well on campaigns against palm oil. And whenever I see a billboard with an orangutan on it campaigning against palm oil, I say, yes. I say, is this what it takes? And always I say, and so many peoples as well. Is it any coincidence that King Kong shown up so much with animals extinct rising again? Brontosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, other twisted notions of the other crafted into scales and claw. And I think about a child so small, so sad, fearful to breathe from all the blood and the air, adult nightmares seeping into her sky and her books and her friends. And just now I remember being her, am being her. And I'm thinking about Donkey Kong as a Super Smash Bros character and what color the thread is between the child and the pixelated animal who pounds the earth in a piece of electronics made with metals forged from this earth. And all through the making of these things, the monkey on screen, the small sad girl and the screen she refused to open her eyes for futilely as the story would seep into the school days of her and her friends. There are our words communicating to all the sentient fellow beings who are placed on this earth gingerly and asked to go forth in it as though this were not a frightening thing as though this very act of going forth did not require a ship full of warm glow around us in order to survive and how we wish for this freight cargo every day, creating it, 
preserving it with oral literatures they can't touch or feel. With herbal medicines, we try to protect from pharmaceutical gloves. With every day, a ticking towards the end of glowing, the end of holding another who could be person, who could be old growth rainforest, who could be King Kong and his tears, who could be Papuan men writing white letters on themselves in jail to display for their trial, at which they're accused of treason against Indonesia that say monyet, which means monkey, which is what evil in some calls good in others. When it wants to let us know this earth is taken in their movie of the present, when the earth is yours, it is yours, yours, yours. Dear protesters, Marauke to Sabang, tears been in courtrooms and witnessed by none. Is yours, glory humans, yours, my dear sayang, semuanya, all dear Lord, ya Tuhan, tanganmu, your hands, tanahmu, your earth, milikmu, are yours. Setiap hari, each day, nafas, breath, adalah doa, is a prayer. Yang mengungkapkan, which conveys ultimatum, kami semua persetan, ultimatum, ultimata, from all of us, damn it all. Dari semua manusia yang muak dan bergelora dalam amarah. Yang masih bisa tertawa antara sesama setiap saat. From all humans who are sick of it and are reveling in rage. Who can still at any time laugh among ourselves. Dan juga ultimatum dari semua yang mereka bakar. And also ultimatum ultimata from all they burn, burned, will burn. Juga dari orang hutan. Also from orangutans. So there's context, obviously, for this big, long poem that I wrote. Um, and you'll notice at the end, I said burns, burned, will burn. And that is another sci-fi element of the Indonesian language, because we don't have tenses. So if I say bakar, that could mean I burn, I will burn, I have burned. And that's another way in which cosmology shapes psychologies. And for me, the past, future, and present are all interconnected, right? It's this beauty of speculative fiction. And um, I apologize. I saw in the chat that you asked me to speak a bit slower um, that I just saw. And I think one thing that's interesting about language also is how it shapes our perception of what is familiar, right? So this whole poem is about, it is about palm oil plantations. It's about a genocide that happened in 1965-66 that was Western backed when Western governments armed and uh, made a hit list that blew up into the killing of around 2 million people, leftist organizers, sexual and gender minorities, ethnic minorities. And that started off a dictatorship that lasted for about 33 years that I was born into and that I went to school in. And I went to school in a very violent environment in which we were traumatized at the age of, of about eight or nine with this really violent film about the supposed coup and like these communists, quote unquote, killing generals and these leftist women doing terrible things to the genitals of generals, like really violent, violent things. Um, this is how we learned the languaging of like the Indonesian women's movement, Gerwani. We were taught that they're very violent. So a lot of people don't know in the 1960s, the largest feminist movement in the world was in Indonesia. Um, we were very progressive, I think, exceeding the West. We had, you know, the Indonesian Women's Conference, even under colonialism in the 1920s. We were against polygamy. We were for women's education. And with this Western back genocide, women who were leftists were also literally killed off. They literally killed off um, the largest feminist movement in the world. And all of this in my poem, shows how this genocide and the capitalist dictatorship that resulted, what was it for? It was to claim the quote unquote nature or environment as resources, right? It was to create the world that we have now. And when I read this poem for Indonesians, they get it immediately because the genocide is so familiar to us who are, you know, maybe raised with leftist parents as I was, or, you know, have a different version of history than we were taught. If it is another genocide that is more um that is more familiar to western audiences they will pick on on those themes but because indonesia is maybe a step removed from the west in terms of like what you know about the genocide that happened to us and what results i kind of like that some things are more opaque or obscure and that actually gets back to the presentation about languaging peatlands so peatlands in the rainforest as i'm sure you all know often come under the remit of sustainable development, quote unquote. What exactly is that, right? For me, the big um, hypocrisy of quote unquote sustainable development often is basically due to 
um, Western forces basically winning the Cold War involving this genocide of leftist and you know organizers, et cetera, in places like Indonesia created this world system where you know Bretton Woods institutions, IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, imposed structural adjustment policies on countries like Indonesia. Um, <laughs> made us get into a whole lot of debt that we are still under, right? And so with climate change and environmental change, you have to remember that countries like Indonesia are in a lot of debt to Western countries. And governments are scrambling to pay off that debt in ways that are terrible for the environment, right? And so I think one hypocrisy is that, right? Where Western governments are like, you need sustainable development, but please continue to pay us money that you don't have. Um, and the way you do that is by creating, you know, mines and factories, et cetera, that are really terrible for the environment and also serve Western markets, right? So basically Indonesia is being gouged. You're gouging our rainforest, right? You're gouging our um, our indigenous communities who are the stewards of peatlands, right? You're, you're, you're forcing people to become migrant workers and go to cities um, and uh, um, uh, go and work in factories like Nike, sweatshops like Uniqlo, you know, for the Western market. And you're like, keep doing that, keep doing that, but also sustainable development, please. And for me, it's just this enormous hypocrisy. Like you treat us like a candy shop where you can destroy and take, but then you're like, oh no, but please try and be a little more sustainable and develop. And that goes into this whole hypocrisy around quote unquote developing countries and underdeveloped regions. So Indonesia has an entire ministry that the title is so horrendous to me. It's called, it, it, the, the translation in English is the ministry for left behind regions, which is so offensive. It's so offensive, right? It's like, a, who, it's, first of all, this whole concept of center and periphery, right? Like everything, Java is the, the most densely populated island in Indonesia. It's got the capital city of Jakarta and that is supposedly quote unquote developed. But it's like terrible for the environment. People are dying of pollution and, and plastic waste and everything else. And that is supposedly development, you know, the sense of development that it's about gentrification, that it's about, um, you know, basically providing more of a, a, a middle-class market. And these other regions that are filled with, again, over 700 indigenous cosmologies related to peatlands, right? that have really deep wisdom and knowledge over centuries are considered underdeveloped. It is a very Western anthropological colonial view of you know, the primitive regions. We have to develop them. <laughs> we have to get them up to speed with modernity. And how we think about peatlands co often comes under this whole sense of um, natural resources, right? <laughs> Which of you, I mean, I really want people to push against the sense of natural resources. If you think of nature and natural resources as the same, or even, you know, nature itself, as I mentioned, is problematic. Natural resources conveys that nature is just there for us to take rather than be in relationship to, right? And so much of how peatlands are discussed in intergovernmental meetings and in environmental literature is like we have to protect our natural resources and that is not how indigenous communities relate to lands that are part of us that are of us we breathe its air they breathe our air. you know it's, this is there are words and languages for these relationships that cannot be touched by something so banal as natural resources and overdevelopment and that relates to how peatlands are often regarded as terra nullius which is the same concept as when, you know, colonists came to Australia, regarded it as terra nullius. There's no people here. There's no quote unquote civilization here, right? There's nothing of worth here and we can do as we like with it. And I see that actually often in how peatlands and indigenous communities around peatlands are regarded in often a sort of paternalistic way, right? Like, oh, let's teach indigenous people to make money and still be in relationship to the peatlands. But if it's not indigenous led, if it is not indigenous led and comes from the bottom up, it is very paternalistic and, and doesn't get at the heart of what it is to be in relationship with peatlands. Uh, there is a, a wonderful, I believe, Martinican philosopher named Edouard Glissant, and I'm connecting peatlands to translation theory here because yeah, he talks a lot about the right to opacity, meaning I know that you all in repeat come from different countries and different languages, right? When you speak to repeat colleagues or people who are familiar with repeat, you speak differently than when you speak with your own families, maybe in a different language, right? 
Um, and sometimes, you know, you have inside jokes. You have words that, okay, maybe they don't understand it. That's okay. That's like when we watch any Western film, for instance, set in, you know, a country that, you know, in a city that we're supposed to know all about Cleveland. Like, there's a lot that is unexplained for us, doesn't, isn't explained in the subtitles, you know, but is just there for us to absorb. And with indigenous languages and indigenous relationships to peatlands, I really argue for the right to opacity, meaning the right for concepts and words not to be translated into English. This may seem really weird coming from, from a woman who literally edits a journal called Modern Poetry in Translation. But if you work with words, you also have to work with the ethics of words, right? And you have to be okay. You have to be really okay with the fact that around the world, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of peatland cosmologies, right? And indigenous cosmologies. And you don't have the right to know all of them. You don't have the right to know all of them. What is your, if you can't even name these languages, right? I can't even name the over 700 languages that are in Indonesia. I don't know all of them. So who is to say that I have the right to go into a community that whose language I've just found out about, right? And say, this is how you relate to peatlands. You don't ask me how, what my relationship is to peatlands. You don't ask me my word for peatlands or words for peatlands. And you don't ask if it's okay for you to know. Because as it is, Indonesia, in, in the, in the indigenous peoples in Indonesia and around the world are under siege. We're being killed, we're being assaulted, we're being uh, brutally um, uh, uh, kicked off our lands. And uh, they're like mobs hired to beat up people so that they will leave their lands and so that the peatlands can be turned into what? Into palm oil plantations, into um, mines, into and into, you know, sometimes quote unquote national parks and a way of managing nature that is under this framework of sustainable development, natural resources, very top down and not indigenous led, right? And this is a form of colonization in and of itself if you're not careful. I know that there are places around the world where if access to indigenous mappings, right? indigenous waterways, ways of knowing. This is treated, um, and this is also an issue with Western academia, right? And how it treats the environment, realm and resources. It's like, we can take all of this knowledge. This is for the common good. And it's that, again, this Western enlightenment sense of universalism. Um, and before we go into q and I'm, I'm a disabled woman, so I'm really informed by the sense of disability justice. And that term was coined by uh, a queer Crips artist of color collective from North America called Sins Invalid, disability justice. It has 10 principles. You can read all about it online, including anti-capitalism, right? And it's very different from this concept of disability rights. So disability rights, as I understand it, and I am relating this to Pete Lands, don't worry. So disability rights, is basically, as I understand it, there's a nation state and it provides rights to disabled people within it, right? By the way, as an, as an Indonesian citizen in London, I do not have access to any public funds as a disabled person. My dis other disabled colleagues who are British get public funds, they get lots of access benefits, and I, as a migrant, am not allowed, right? So disability rights for whom? Usually only for citizens, right? Not for refugees, not for migrants, et cetera. Disability justice, thinks of ableism as this colonial concept of what is a good body, what is the best body, what is the best mind, right? That comes from colonialism, the sense of universalism that denies all these other indigenous cosmologies. So when you think about, and, and you don't have to be disabled to be affected by ableism, the sense of think about when you have been told that you are smart, that you are good, that you are capable, right? These are all societally determined concepts. And think about how those concepts apply to how a person is supposed to relate to nature and to the peatlands. What is good? What is best? What, how should a body mind relate to cosmologies and geographies? And when we look at justice, we're not looking at nation states and capitalism as fait accompli, this is the end of the world, the end of history, right? I think Ursula Le Guin was like, capitalism is seen as a as a as a an, as inevitable, so did the divine rights of kings once, right? Systems change, systems change. And when you think of things in terms of justice instead of rights, you have a long view of history. Again, remember in Indonesian, past, present, and future, all the same soup, depending on context, right? It's all interrelated. And I want us to think about peatland justice. 
rather than peatland rights for a moment and think just sort of mull over in your mind, what does peatland justice look like? What do justices look like? Because justices are varied as well. You know, like I said, the term disability justice was quoted by Sins Invalid. But around the world, there have been disability justices from before that term was quote unquote coined. I come from Javanese culture has disabled gods, right? And then Dutch colonialism went in there and was like, no, actually disabled people aren't holy. You're shit. <laughs> you know, you're terrible, undesirable people. These are societal systems, right? So I want you to think about innumerable peatland justice cosmologies that exist in the world, indigenous localized cosmologies that are biome centric, right? That are based on place, right? And not a top-down nation state sense. And of how they're being bulldozed every day by concepts of what is a best human being and how can we best relate to peatlands that is ultimately about treating peatlands as money and resources. And I want you to be okay with not knowing, you will never know in your lifetimes, all the different peatland justices there are. And what might give you the right to know a different peatland justice, right? What would give you the right to know? Do you have a relationship to that community? Why do you want to know? Is it extractive for you to know? And think about the dangerous situations that so many indigenous communities relating to peatlands are in. And think about your position in this landscape of criminality and injustice and how we might bend the arc of it towards justice. Thank you. So I think uh, like a one minute break. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. It's super interesting. Um, let's take uh, a minute break and then we can come back for a question or two. If anyone has any questions, please put them into the chat so we can just straight up go because we don't have so much time. There's a session coming right after. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions to put in the chat? Thank you for whoever filled in the jam board as well, by the way. <laughs> I'm just checking it out. It's very cool. Thank you for listening. Thanks for having me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'm, I have. Okay. Um, I thought this uh, this point that you were making about this. I guess this sense of feeling this right to know other um, other cosmologies and this this belief that all of this needs to be translated so we have access to all this information. I thought that was really interesting, and I think that was something quite novel that came up. Um, and I was wondering um, in what ways this kind of um, plays out with also, I guess the I guess what can come from sharing different um, ideas and knowledges and um, cosmologies. And I wondered if you could talk to that, to, to, these, to the two sides of it, the one that it's important to kind of protect it from this kind of extractivist um, narrative and the other side of, yeah, the, the growth that comes from sharing. Yeah, so uh, Bianca, wrote in the chat, we forget that the search for knowledge can be dangerous and has been tied to colonialism and imperialism 100%. So it's interesting because I think that trend, I think about translation a lot, right? It, it is my job. Um, and I come across a lot of Western translators being like, anything can be translated. And actually, I, I quote him a million times. Uh, my, my colleague, Jeremy Tiang, um, 
uh, recent International Booker Judge winner and translator and writer is amazing, um, said, actually, the truth is nothing can be translated and all of us are just trying our best, right? Like you all come from different countries, different languages, like th th there's some things like you, nothing can actually be translated. One and uno, it hits the same in, you know, in the song Despacito or whatever, you know, <laughs> like the affect is different, the way it hits our bodies is different, right? The way it can be used and these cosmologies, again, as I said in Indonesian, one can be one or plural, right? You know, you, you go to a different language, your whole psychology and cosmology differs. So think about peatlands, right? Like bakau or gambut or, or words for peatlands, right? They can be plural or singular, which I think is very powerful because it speaks to a sense of collectivity. Um, and if we want to be ethical people within collectivity, we have to understand that our, we have positionality, right? Us all speaking in English is a colonial language. It's a colonial language, I fully admit it. Um, I have a poem called Money for Your English. It's like, it is a survival mechanism and it is a way for us to, you know, this is a beautiful festival where we get to connect through a common language, all of us from different places, right? And that is a form of sharing that we're trying to be ethical, right? But I think it is, it is a sense of entitlement that I think a lot of Western anthropologists or quote unquote environmentalists have of like, I'm going into this place and I, I can be here, I can spread this knowledge. And it is very dangerous, as I said, to actually spread knowledge about indigenous places when they're under siege. You know what I mean? Like there have been instances in Indonesia where, you know, like um, a global environmental NGO gets access to like indigenous maps and that, that, is connected to their connection to companies, right? And those companies eventually f those people over. You know, you have to, you can't be naive and think that you're 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 talking about a country, especially if you're, you know, like uh, there's class, there's race, there's gender, there's citizenship, there's all these different strata of power that you are enveloped in, right? And things need to be indigenous led, and you cannot impose a sense of environmentalism upon a place that is not led by the people in it. And I think unfortunately, Western environmentalism has a sense of do-goodism that it can turn into, you know, like we have the right to know this, we have the right to spread this. You have to be very gentle with language. You have to be, you have to have an actual relationship to people. Like I remember once I was working in Aceh, which is a province at the Northern tip of Sumatra after the tsunami hit. And there's a woman who came there and she was like, yeah, I just read about all this violence and destruction here. And I just had to see it for myself. And I was like, you're just here to like basically poverty tourism this place and then I thought my god like at that time I was working for the UN like what am I doing here you know am I doing that right like I'm a kid from Jakarta like I have you know indigeneities in my in my background but like in me going to this place where I don't have a direct connection and trying to quote unquote help it what am I doing, right? What, what systems am I in? I question that all the time. Um, so Jamie asked, you shared your screen when you read your poem showing us the spatial range of words in the page. You have spoken about language today and I wonder what your th thoughts are with written and oral language. How does one translate between those? Do you how do you feel peatland languages feel about speaking versus writing? Well, as I said, I cannot speak for all the thousands of peatland cosmologies and languages in the world, right? Um, there is a really uh, wonderful Kashmiri writer who and translator named Oniza Drabu and Kashmiri is an oral language right and she says it should be translated orally ideally you know like because it is an oral language like the medium matters um, and I think so it's it's very dependent on case um, Irene raised hand yes but I believe Natasha also had a question maybe she can go first hi hi thank you um so firstly, I want to say Tarima Kase to Oka. Um, I'm half Malay, so um, just to say about language, Tarima Kase, when you thank someone, it means receive love, which is a lovely way to thank people. <laughs> so um, two, two questions. I, I noticed you use the word man when I think you mean humans, uh, but I, I'm sure there's a consciousness about that. And I, I'd like to ask you why you chose not to say um, people were um and then the second question and I, I completely get the white savior thing but um my my sister has worked with indigenous people in canada and she says that um you know i suppose it's the kind of generalization about indigenous people and them having certain knowledge when 
she was saying that a lot of them where she worked with wanted what every other but quite Canadian wanted, which is, you know, money and whatever it is. So um, I suppose the question is about generalizing um, Indigenous um, people and, you know, what they might come to the table with. So those are my two questions. And again, to Rimakase. Sama Sama, which means sort of, <laughs> you're welcome back to you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to hear that. Thanks for your okay. questions, Natasha. Can I just, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we only have two minutes on this Zoom just because there's the next session coming up. Um, so I, I was wondering maybe if there's another way that we could communicate this. Um, and it would be really lovely to hear your answer on this um, and to continue this. Yeah, for sure. Put it around next slide, Kaya. I don't know if that would work if we get to social media. What, sorry? I was just going to say, I think we have we have another 15 minutes before the next session starts. So if you would like to okay. ask a question, I think there should be time for that. Okay. Yeah, we can go into breakout rooms if we want to do a briefing. So it will okay. just continue for a bit. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay, continue. thank you. No, that's all right. And also, if you do want to, um, uh, I'm on Twitter, mail by Kate, if you want to talk to me there. Um, so yes, thank you, Natasha. Whenever I said man, I should have done this, which is like quotation marks. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm sort of talking about the Western concept of man as being patriarchal, of course, and also universal. And I, I think I hope my talk um, with your second point, uh, yes, absolutely. And I think the point of my talk is you cannot generalize indigenous people because there are hundreds of thousands of cosmologies in the world and you have to ask them or us what we want, right? And that is the point. And, and I think that a lot of times with regards to peatlands and, and environmental strategies, it's very top down. Indigenous people are not uh, part of, uh, they don't have, a, we don't have a seat at the table, right? and are not leading the conversation. And I think, again, it's very biome dependent, right? And it's very community dependent. You can't generalize with indigenous peoples. Like I come from two cultures that are completely different, you know, um, and have a different relationship to lands and to, and to peatlands as well. Um, so I think, it, it, I think it's, it's important to think about peatland justice as encompassing I mean, it's so complex and there's, you know, the world is vast. My dad likes to say, dunia tidak selebar daun kelor, which means like the world is not as 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 uh, wide as a kelor leaf, you know, like there's so much we don't know. I, I, I can't even name the, you know, the, the cultures in my country, over 700 of them. And that, I, I think, it, uh, I think a healthy way to think about peatlands is to be okay with, we only know a tiny bit of the picture, right? And how can we connect with each other with the tiny bits of the picture that we have and, and try and help each other out and, and, and do something, but not with a sense of, you know, the psychological sense of these are natural resources, is sustainable development, I'm helping underdeveloped countries all with quotation marks, right? Um, that I think is, is really troubling. So thanks for those questions, yeah. Oh, and another thing about orality is that um, obviously, with the coming of European colonization, there's a lot of oral cultures that were denigrated or, you know, um, decimated, and it turned into a very bureaucratic nation state written culture kind of thing, right? And the the dismissal of oral wisdoms and traditions is, is something that is real, but also the assumption that indigenous cultures don't have written languages, right? <laughs> because, you know, indigenous cultures, many, many do have, you know, written languages as well. So it's not just oral. Um, there are many forms of language. And there's also sign languages. There's indigenous sign languages. Like there's this one village in Bali that have developed their own sign language called Katakolok because they have a lot of deaf people in the village. And it's only spoken in that village. It's an indigenous sign language, right? The sign language for Indonesia is Bisindo for Indonesian sign language. So Bisindo has a colonial relationship to Katakolok. You know, so you have to think about all these layers of of colonialities and power spectrums um, with regards to languaging and yeah and peatlands. Um, yes, Irene, there's time for from my side as well. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. No, I just wanted to double check. I thought maybe you have to head off somewhere. Um, I hope my microphone's okay. But with, with the area, um, but I I was just reflecting on and 
I just like I think myself I'm still sort of at the start of unlearning and um, learning journey with regards to understanding my own positionality and understanding global histories and histories of colonization um, but I think at least I personally experience the tension with regards to on the one hand as a privileged a citizen of the Netherlands um, feeling like I should step up my game and you know like sort of take my responsibility because my ancestors and also like my the state that I'm part of um, uh, is has been so destructive and is so destructive and on the other hand not wanting to lead or dominate the conversation because that is not my place um, and I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about that tension yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone feels that, right? Like I work in disability justice circles as well. I'm not blind. I advocate for, you know, accessibility for my blind friends. And it's like, I'm not, you know, who am I? You know what I mean? Like, who am I to say? I think that a lot of people have been, have been saying um, publicly what we would like allyship to look like and what allyship really looks like. I say that you cannot call yourself an ally just call yourself an ally without that title being anointed by the community you're talking about you know like that's it's kind of for me personally I don't want to go around being like I'm an ally to blind people which some people do you know it's like I don't even dare call myself that until my blind friends are like Oga you're an ally okay and even then I'm not gonna say like I'm an ally guys hello excuse me hi I'm an I'm an ally you know <laughs> it's I think allyship can be problematic if it becomes about the ally. It, you know, I once worked for an organization where um, the focus, if it was like Queer History Month or Black History Month, was, was on the allies. And it's like, no, it's on the actual people that you're trying to be allies with. And listen, listen and learn. And, and there are ways for you to contribute without um, dominating a conversation, leading a conversation, or speaking for people, I think there are definite ways to do that, and there there are um, there are people who are true allies, but it needs to be proven over time, right? All of us are trying to prove ourselves as good allies over time. And I also want to say, with regards to colonization and history, colonization is not gone; it's the present. Um, between 1990 and 2015, I believe the amount of wealth that could the quote-unquote global north or the world minority took from the global South was comparable to what happened in colonization in the 19th century. You know, like what I'm saying is like, Indonesia continues to be this grab bag, mines, factories, plantations, the theft is happening. And you add that to global debt, right? You add that to the debt that is imposed by Western nations. Like it's not of the past, this is happening. And some people call it neo-colonization. I call it colonization. It's, <laughs> there's no other word for it, right? Um, and it's strange to see how environmentalism operates within these nation state and intergovernmental organization structures with the knowledge that y'all are stealing from us all the time, you know, like, it's just, it, there's a sense of disconnect that I find that I think really needs to come to the fore. Um, yeah. Because it's not okay to be like some peatlands are okay to destroy, but let's keep these peatlands over here, which is, which is what a lot of policy is saying, right? Carbon offsets. It's like shall take this rain, this like peatlands area. This is a lot of carbon for you, but it's essentially selling indigenous land to companies. Yeah, it's just, it's another way to make to the financialization of nature is a real trend and it is very disturbing. And I think I might've talked about this in, in a previous repeat session, but di biodiversity credits is the next big thing. You know, They keep finding ways to financialize nature and to turn quote unquote nature, which again is this concept that I don't really believe in, you know, into quantifiable, quantifiable things that are so reductive and not related to place-based cosmologies at all. Um, and the inclusion, I think inclusion is also a word to be, to be suspicious of because how indigenous communities are quote unquote included into these global systems with regards to peatland ecologies is something to observe, <laughs> is something to observe. When we say inclusion, we don't always like what we're being included into, you know, um, we have to be included in the global economy because we live as, in this society. We live in this capitalistic society. We don't always like how, you know, I don't know who made this 
dress, you know, that bothers me, right? We don't know who, like where the wheat came from necessarily in our breakfast this morning, that kind of bothers us. Um, and I think a, a sense of intentionality and relationality, real connections between people who are part of our lives, even on a molecular level, even on a like, where did I get my food? Did this come at the cost of peatlands? You know, where did I get my clothes? Did this come at the cost of peatlands? Where did I get my, you know, shampoo? Did this come at the cost of peatlands? And being very like, very palm oil free. Like occasionally my partner will forget and I'm like, no, and he's like, I'm sorry, because it's it's violence to me. It's violence. And I don't, I don't think that I don't think it's okay to divorce all these banal violences from how they interact in everyday life. <laughs> it's so depressing. I'm so sorry, but you know, that's that's the truth. And and yeah, just to be aware of how how peatlands are 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 part of people's whole cosmologies for being and and having systems imposed on them is not a small thing. It's actually a, a huge, it's everything. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think all of us here really, really appreciate the session. I think it was really, um, yeah, it was really great to hear from you. Um, yeah, and um, thank you everyone else also for uh, making notes on the, on the board and then we can all see, um, like other people also who are here can see like the outcomes of this in, in different forms and it's co-created and thank you Frankie as well. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, um, I think we'll have to kind of close this Zoom now, but I hope to see you all in the next session. Bye, okay. Bye, thank you. Thank you.